and say that several months ago in Detroit, we had an investigation at which over 150 honorably discharged and many very highly decorated veterans testified to war crimes committed in Southeast Asia. Not isolated incidents, but crimes committed on a day-to-day -day basis with a full awareness of officers at all levels of command. It's impossible to describe to you exactly what did happen in Detroit, the emotions in the room, the feelings of the men who were reliving their experiences in Vietnam. But they did. They relived the absolute horror of what this country, in a sense, made them do. Uh, they told the stories of times that they had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads, taped wires from portable telephones to human genitals and turned up the power, cut off limbs, blown up bodies, randomly shot at civilians, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan, shot cattle and dogs for fun, poisoned food stocks, and generally ravaged the countryside of South Vietnam, in addition to the normal ravage of war and the normal uh, and very particular ravaging which is done by the applied bombing power of this country. We called this investigation the Winter Soldier Investigation. The term Winter Soldier is a play on words of Thomas Paine's in 1776 when he spoke of the some Sunshine Patriot and summertime soldiers who deserted at Valley Forge because the going was rough. And we who've come here to Washington have come here because we feel we have to be winter soldiers now. We could come back to this country and we could be quiet. We could hold our silence. We could not tell what went on in Vietnam. But we feel because of what threatens this country, the fact that the crimes threaten it, not reds and not red coats, but the crimes which we're Here committing. Here the remarks at the American Jewish Committee. This is about 35 minutes. I want to thank the leadership and the membership of the AJC and the Jacob Blaustein Institute, Bob, David Harris, who over nearly a quarter of a century has helped to shape this distinguished organization like no one else, and of course your new president, Stan Bergman. I thank you, every single one of you, for all that you do for Israel, but more for human rights, for civil rights around the world for women's rights, in fighting racism, religious intolerance, and torture. Thank you for all that you do to fight anti-Semitism around the world. I'm proud that uh, I just appointed Ira Foreman to lead that fight against anti-Semitism from the State Department. And you have a very strong partner in Ira. And of course, I thank you for what you do for the American Jewish community. As many of you might know, if you don't, I tell you now, my brother Cam is a proud member of the community. He converted to Judaism 30 years ago before marrying his wife, Kathy. And this morning, I'm proud to say he started as acting Secretary of Commerce, the Commerce Department, and I'm told that today we become the first ever two brothers to lead cabinet-level agencies at the same time. When the psalmist wrote the hymn, Hina Matov Umanayim, how good and pleasing it is for brothers to sit together in unity, I'm pretty sure he wasn't picturing us sitting together in the cabinet room of the White House, uh, though our mother may well have. Uh, either way, I, I can tell you that it will be an honor to serve alongside my brother Cam, even if it's just for a short while. For more than a century, AJC has been a partner and a pioneer in defining the relationship between American Jews and Israel and a leader in strengthening that relationship. You've built bridges during difficult times and hopeful ones alike, and we've seen them all in this journey. I know many look at the landscape today and you're not inclined to act somehow too risky, too much turmoil. 
Uh, there are a lot of people who are quick to call this moment too difficult a time, too dangerous, too daunting a time. I understand that temptation. And I fully recognize the challenges and the predicament in which Israel finds itself. But I also firmly believe that this is a hopeful time. If we choose to make it so, this can actually be a time of possibility and a time of promise. And with your help, it can be a time of peace. Now, I know there is no issue so close to your hearts as the future of Israel's security. The threat from Iran, the unrest in Syria, the question surrounding nuclear weapons and chemical weapons, the lingering fallout of the Arab Spring, the status of a peace process that is hardly a process at all. All of these matter tremendously to each and every one of you, and they matter above all to Israel's future. And Israel's future is what I want to talk to you about today. I had the great honor of becoming Secretary of State in February. I visited Israel in March, April, and May, and I will be back soon. I know Senator Obama understands what is at stake here. It has been an honor to contest these primaries with him. It is an honor to call him my friend, and let me be very clear. I know that Senator Obama will be a good friend to Israel. You also see our commitment to Israel's security in our steadfast opposition to any attempt to delegitimize the State of Israel. As I said at the United Nations last year, Israel's existence must not be a subject for debate, and efforts to chip away at Israel's legitimacy will only be met by the unshakable opposition of the United States. Well, hello and welcome. I'm Marzia Hashimi, and thanks for joining us for another Face to Face. Uh, today, very happy to welcome our guests right here in the studios in Tehran, uh, and that would be Ms. Cynthia McKinney who is joining us and of course she's a former congresswoman in the United States and also a former presidential candidate There's of the Green Party. tremendous pressure inside the political process to make sure that the voters stay aligned inside either the Democrat or Republican parties. Why? Because both of those parties have been captured by special interests and those special interests are quite frankly the antithesis of the interests of the people. And so therefore, for example, if um, people in the United States care about education, but unfortunately there's a banker that gets in between the student and the student's ability to go to school, if they care about uh, health care, there's the insurance industry that gets in between the patient and the doctor who is seeking to provide care. And so we have all of these special interests that have positioned themselves in between the political decision makers and the people themselves. The process now is more responsive to those special interests than it is to the values and the wishes of the American people. When the American people then decide that they are sick and tired of this kind of configuration, the only place to go so that one's values have the likelihood or the opportunity to become policy is outside of the corral that has Did been Did you experience you. anything uh, in that realm as far as the, what one would call the interference in American policy uh, by APAC? Well, it's interesting because when I first uh, went to Congress, I did not go to Congress to um, pay particular attention to any area outside of the black community that I represented that was in need and, of course, uh, U.S. Africa policy, which was abhorrent and unfortunately still is. Um, but what I 
ran into, I bumped into at almost every turn were these special interests. And there's no more special interest that has any more influence than the pro-Israel lobby. And so then when I did outreach, for example, to the Muslim community in the United States, uh, I bumped into the pro-Israel lobby, which of course does not want to have to contend with a politicized Muslim community, which is as large as and is as wealthy as the pro-Israel lobby is in the United States. So yes, I um, uh, first-handedly and also frontally <laughs> was uh, 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 assaulted by the presence of the pro-Israel lobby to such an extent. Physically assaulted? Well, politically assaulted. Okay. To such an extent that my father had to ask the question publicly, what does Stone Mountain, Georgia, have to do with Israel? What I was doing was servicing the needs of my constituents. And I was not allowed to do that because I did not toe the line on U.S. policy for Israel. What line is that that they wanted? Were you told directly that you had to toe a line or explain that to me? Well, every candidate for Congress at that time had a pledge. They were given a pledge to, to sign. And I was uh, new on the scene. And uh, so the pledge had Jerusalem as the capital city, uh, the military superiority of Israel. American Congress people have to sign this pledge. Yes, you sign the pledge. If you don't sign the pledge, you don't get money. So for example, it was almost like uh, water torture for me. My parents observed this. I would get a call and uh, the person on the other end of the phone would say, I want to do a fundraiser for you. And then we would get into the planning. I would get really excited because, of course, you have to have money in order to run a campaign. And then two weeks, three weeks into the planning, they would say, did you sign the pledge? And then I would say, no, I didn't sign the pledge. And then my fundraiser would go kaput. So well, let, I just want to get into this pledge a little bit more. Um, so this is uh, basically something that is mandatory, that every congressperson has to sign saying that what Jerusalem you said is the capital of Israel and what else uh, uh, you make a commitment that you will vote to support the military superiority of Israel that um, uh, the economic assistance that Israel wants that you would uh, vote to provide that. This isn't a question for the Congress people serving that they are representing or they're supposed to be representing the people of the United States, not a foreign country, and yet they have to pledge allegiance yes. to a foreign state. That's what no I one was, questions this. That's what I was asked to do. And um, I made it public. This is probably nobody had said anything about it. but. I made it public and then, you know, the excuse was, well, you know, those were just overzealous uh, ad advocates for Israel. So then the tactic changed. And uh, but this is what is done for 535 members of the United States Congress. 100 senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives have to now write a paragraph, which basically says the same thing. So it's not a pledge, but it's a paragraph and you post it and you know, there are these forums you have to go to at the synagogues or whatever. And then, you know, if you don't perform appropriately, then you don't get money to run your